Welcome back to part two of chapter two in EE 111 lecture series. We're going to finish up chapter two in this video. It's going to be a little bit longer than the first one. So if you're treating this like a lecture, you might want to split this video into two separate lectures to maintain your sanity, or you can power right through it. I guess maybe speed me up as necessary. What we're going to go through in this is Ohm's law, the resistor, and Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law. And as I told you at the end of the last video, these three things really enable us to do everything we need to do with circuit analysis for the purposes of this book, or at least this book through chapter four. So this is really important stuff. And you're gonna actually have a lot of powerful tools at your disposal once this chapter is over. One of the things that might be different about the way we address this from what the way you've seen in the past is, we're gonna use some slightly strange ways of generating these equations, some slightly unusual ways of, of uh, methodically developing an equation, even ways that might seem a little bit backwards or might seem a little bit counterintuitive. And the reason we're doing that is because we're trying to make sure we have tools that when we get to complicated circuits, we can use consistently to get a correct equation without having a sign flipped upside down or having something backwards or having something incorrect. So, so repetition and consistency is really a key to getting the right solution with these approaches. And some of the things we do is gonna, are going to seem a bit strange, but there is a reason why we're doing that. So jumping right into it, the resistor, you've probably seen these before. A resistor is a basic ideal two terminal device. Two terminal device meaning current that flows in one terminal flows out the other. It has a labeled voltage across it um, and it's a linear device. So resistors are passive elements. They have no way to, to power anything. You can't power something with a resistor. It cannot provide energy to, to other circuit elements, it can only absorb energy. It can only dissipate energy. It can only receive, you know, all the million ways to describe it. Basically, it can only have positive power. And we'll see mathematically why that works out a little bit later. The behavior of resistor is dictated by what's called Ohm's law. Ohm's law is very simple. It's very simple. It says the voltage across a resistor is equal to current times the resistance. And passive sign convention applies to Ohm's law, which means when it is the labeled current entering the labeled positive terminal, we use V equals IR. Or again, if it's the labeled, if it's the current exiting the negative terminal, entering the positive terminal, exiting the negative terminal is the same thing. Again, two, two, two terminal elements, current entering one terminal, exit the other terminal. The other form of it is whenever we show current entering the negative terminal or when we show current exiting the positive terminal, which once again, entering the negative is the same as exiting the positive. If we do that, if we have a labeled current shown entering the negative, we use the form of Ohm's law with a negative sign in it, V equals negative I times R. And that's gonna be very important for us to pay attention to. A lot of times what happens is and we're gonna do a little bit of it in this chapter and we do a lot of it later, we get to pick the, we get to pick the direction of a current, we get to, a current label, we get to pick the direction of a voltage label. And so sometimes we will deliberately pick current and voltage label directions so we don't have to use the negative sign version of the equation and that's fine. As long as once you've picked your arbitrary variable directions, you stick with the rules for it. Ohm's law, the equation is simple. V is equal to I times R. And another way to think about that is in a, as a function of voltage with respect to current, because we have V equals something times, you know, it's same as Y equals something times X. That's a linear function, which has a, that something is going to represent the slope. So in a mathematical expression, if you had Y of X equals b times x. You would of course describe that as the slope. We have the same thing with Ohm's law. We have v is equal to r times i. But once again, r can be thought of as the slope of this expression. And so you can see if you have a function of voltage with respect to current, the slope of this line, slope of this line is the resistance. And if the resistance is higher, the slope is steeper. And if the resistance is lower, the slope is shallower. And the other thing is you can use all the techniques you've learned in math for deriving an equation from a diagram to work backwards and find resistance. If you have any, 
current or if you have combinations of current and voltage values, or I guess even one, one non-zero current voltage value, you're able to derive the resistance for a resistor. So I'm not gonna belabor the, the process of deriving a mathematical equation or finding a slope. Hopefully everybody's got that fairly firmed up, but I just wanted to explain it that resistance is slope of the function voltage as a function of current. Power, so what about power for resistors? Well, we know the power equation. Power is equal to V times I, but for in the case of resistors, we'd really like to have power as a function of R because we don't necessarily always know voltage and current. We don't always want to calculate them. We'd rather have for a resistor, some function for power, power as a function of resistance. Well, we know we have, we have our power equation here, which is standard. We've already talked about that a lot. We also have Ohm's law, which says V equals IR. And so one thing we can do is we can substitute that V in for right here. And if we do that, we get power is equal to I squared times R. So if we know the resistance of resistor and we know the current flowing through it, we can determine the power by just using I squared R. Alternatively, we can rewrite Ohm's law. We can rewrite Ohm's law as I is equal to V over R. So again, that's just, that's dividing both sides of the equation by R and kind of flipping it, but it should be easy to see how current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. And we can substitute that in right here. And if we do that, we get power is equal to V times V over R or power is equal to V squared over R. And these are the two forms of the power equation for resistors. Power is equal to I squared R or power is equal to V squared divided by R. And one thing you'll notice about these is we have the voltage and current term in both of these squared. And that means that regardless of whether the voltage is positive or negative or the current is positive or negative, the power will always be a positive power mathematically because we're squaring it. So if it's negative, it's gonna become positive. And that's also though, because resistance is always a positive value. So resistance for an actual resistor is always positive. There are rare cases where for the purposes of doing an analysis, you will treat resistance as negative in certain situations, or there are circuits you can build that are actively powered devices that function as negative resistors. But if it's an actual resistor, it's always a positive resistance values. And so therefore you can see mathematically, these equations will always be positive. And that's what we mean mathematically when we say a resistor always, it, it can only dissipate power. Resistor can only absorb power. It can't power, it can't have negative power. It can't supply power to something else in a circuit. Let's go back to our red pen. Okay, so two forms of the power equation, great for our resistors. To, to keep in mind though, Ohm's law, V equals IR, two forms of power for a resistor. So if we know only the current or only the voltage, we can find power directly from the resistance. And the other thing is, keep in mind, we have passive sign convention active. So V equals IR only applies to the case where the labeled current is flowing into the labeled positive terminal. Oops. Okay, so let's do some example problems. One thing you'll notice is there's an example problem missing here, and we will fill that in later after we talk about conductance instead of resistance. So. So let's, looking at these circuits, these are circuits that have resistors in them. Let's find the values of V and I as listed here. So first of all, let's do circuit A. We have labeled, this labeled VA across here and that's shown here. Now, why do they kind of show it in the middle? The book does that a lot. It's because these share the same term. This is all one terminal, it's all one wire. This is all one wire. So this labeled voltage is actually, you can kind of think of it as the voltage across the current supply and the voltage across the resistor because both the current supply and the resistor share two values. So they kind of put the label in the middle to kind of just make it clear that it's not, it's not the voltage across the current supply or the voltage across the resistor, it's the voltage across both. But suffice it to say, we have this, um, this known current, we have one amp of current here which on the resistor side, that one amp of current is flowing into the labeled positive terminal. So what version of the of Ohm's law do we need to use? We need to use for A, 
we need to use V equals I times R. V is unknown, right? That's VA equals one amp times eight ohms, Ugh. eight volts. So VA as labeled here is eight volts. And for the power, well, in this case, we already solved for the voltage, so we know both the current and the resist and the voltage, but I would much rather take one squared than eight squared. Oh, it's, you know, it's not that tough, I guess, 64, but, um, but we'll do power is equal to I squared times R. That's one squared times eight, which is eight watts. Let's jump to C. So in the case of C, we have, this is interesting, we have one amp. So we have our labeled negative, labeled positive. We have one amp flowing here. So we have one amp of current flowing into the labeled negative terminal here. So this is, just to make it more clear here, this labeled VC is oriented like this across the resistor and our one amp of current is flowing into the negative terminal. So therefore, which version of the power equation do we need to use here? Which version of, the, of Ohm's law do we need to use? We need to use V is equal to negative I R. So in this case, so VC equals negative one times 20 equals negative 20 volts. So VC is as labeled as negative 20 volts. And it's a little weird that VC had a positive and negative, which corresponded to the positive and negative terminals of the resistor. And this current kind of wraps, the current kind of wraps its way around the circuit. So the current shown going down on this side, but that current flows around and up this way. So it's a little strange, but it's kind of one of those things that practice helps with doing it lots of times helps with. That's why we're doing these expressions, these, these examples here. And then the power dissipated for, by this resistor. Again, we can just do power is equal to I squared R. Which is gonna be one squared times 20. Okay, and lastly, let's go to D. So in this case, we have this labeled current ID in this direction. The labeled current ID. I'm just going to redraw it for some weird reason. I don't know. And our labeled voltage here, we have 50 volts. Our 50 volt supply is like this. I guess I could have picked the label backwards and said it was negative 50, but you know, I'm not going to. So I'm going to label this, you know, this is my 50 volts is my known 50 volts. So in that case, if we have a known 50 volts here across this resistor. So I'm just going to keep it labeled the way I, because I already know the voltage and I know it's 50 oriented that way. I'm just going to pick that as my, as my, Label and direction. Again, I could have flipped the labels and then it would have been negative 50 volts, but I'd rather not do that. But now we show ID is flowing into the negative terminal as labeled. So we have V equals negative I R. In that case, we have 50 equals negative I times 25, I, rewriting that we have I equals 50 divided by negative 25, negative two amps. So, so we have negative two amps as our, and I think I just drew that under my, I think I just I kind of moved my, sorry, I have a preview, it shows my face and I, had it in the wrong spot of the screen here. So I think I just, I think I just did some math underneath my face here. So I'm just gonna redo that just for fun here. So rewriting that we have 
I equals negative 50 over 25, which equals negative 2. Okay. Amps. And again, how do we want to do this? So we could do it. Let's, yeah, let's do for fun. Power is V squared over R. In this case, that's 50 squared divided by 25. So 50 squared is 2,500 divided by 25. That's easy. That's 100. Okay. So we just burned through some examples there. Hopefully those, you know, these are deliberately chosen. Some of them are deliberately chosen to be a little bit weird and a little bit backwards and a little bit confusing, but hopefully the more examples we do, the clearer it gets. So let's talk a little bit more about resistance. What, right? We said resistance, usually we just say, what is it? Well, that's the, what's voltage divided by current, right? We just define it in terms of Ohm's law, but what is it really? What causes resistance? Resistance is caused by a lot of things, but fundamentally it's caused by anything within a conductor or within a material that carries charge carriers that causes those charge carriers to lose energy as they move through the material. So most often this is, Resistance is caused by inelastic collisions between electrons in a metal and ionic cores of the, or, you know, cores of the, of the, um, the metal atoms themselves. Sometimes it's caused by other things. Sometimes it's not inelastic collision. Sometimes it's absorption and re-emission with emission of photons or, or phonons. Phonons are kind of little particles of vibration kind of, but they're ultimately they become heat, but so really most of the time we're talking about losing energy to heat, things becoming heat. There are again, cases where thing, energy is radiated away, but most of the time it's, it's heat. And, um, and for the purposes of this class, we do consider resistance to be ideal. So we say resistance is independent of the current that's flowing through the resistor we say resistance is independent of the temperature of the resistor. In practice, these are actually very poor assumptions. So most re good resistors are pretty close, but um, you actually, if you really want an ideal resistor, a resistor whose resistance doesn't change much with temperature and whose resistance is actually quite linear with current, these are very expensive resistors. If you want it, the more linear you get a resistor, the more it costs, the more ideal you want it to be, the more it costs. And this, so this uh, dapper gentleman over here, Marlon Kraft, he worked at NIST. He's kind of the king of resistance. And he is all about precision. NIST is all about precision measurement and standards. And so he is somebody who really measures resistance down to the nano ohm. Most of us don't ever mess with the resistance anywhere near the nano ohm range, but that's kind of, he, he dabbles in precision. So just kind of wanted to show that. But one thing to notice is look at this little apparatus he's got here. See these big giant claws here? So those are, they look like they are each about $300 worth of copper. These massive copper, copper claws. Why did it, why have these massive copper claws? Well, low resistance. I mean, I'm guessing low resistance. I don't know the context of the photo, but you're going to pay that much for copper and connect it to electrodes is probably trying to keep the resistance low. I'm guessing these are also trying to keep the resistance quite low, those little braided cables there. So is copper the best conductor out there? We're going to talk, and I'm going to have a lecture next week for you that kind of goes over some, some fun stuff, including uh, resistance and resistivity of different types of metals. But is copper, copper is expensive. It's not that cheap. But is it the best conductor? Think to yourself, do you think copper is the best conductor? Don't look, don't cheat. Don't look at the internet. Don't look at a table or anything like that. It's not, it's not even, well, it's pretty close to the best elemental conductor, but it's not, it's not, it's, it's not, there's a couple that are better. Usually when, when I ask students, you know, for raise hands, what's, what's the best conductor? What's the, what's the metal with the lowest resistance per, per unit material, per, per centimeter? Usually they come up with gold. So people seem to know that gold is a, is a better conductor than copper, which it is. That's true. 
but there's a better one and the better conductor is silver. Why do we not use silver? We don't use silver for partially the same reason we tend not to use copper, and that is it tends to form a, coro uh, it tends to, to, to oxidize in air. So in, in ambient air where it's exposed to oxygen and water, it, it readily forms a surface reaction. So silver is not great. You all know that, you know, people you probably have older people who spend time cleaning silver. It's always seemed like a silly, silly waste of time to me, but um, just, get a, just get polished stainless steel. I don't know. But you've probably seen people polishing it. They're, you know, mostly they're, they're polishing off this sort of, I don't know what it's called for silver, but in, in for copper, it's called a patina, just this layer of surface oxidation and reaction and, and that's not ideal. And also silver is expensive. So we tend not to use silver as a conductor ever. Copper, we tend to also not use as a conductor. It is very common as a conductor, but we tend not to use it in part because it's expensive and it's, and it has those corrosive problems. And also it's heavy. So what's a, a metal that's used a lot that's fairly conductive that's light? What's a metal that you have probably all strung out through your neighborhood is used to, to carry current. Aluminum. Aluminum is not a great, it's not particularly a great conductor, but it's lightweight and it's not that expensive. And being lightweight, people like it for power lines. People like to use aluminum because if you didn't use aluminum, if you used copper, you'd have really heavy lines and they'd probably drag your, your power poles down into the mud. They'd probably sort of self bury themselves in the mud, which I've seen happen. I saw a power pole installation one time where they put a, uh, they put a, uh, uh, what are those things called? Well, now, now I'm losing my mind here doing this video when I'm tired. Uh, but they basically tried to, tried to uh, pi a pile drive, right? They were trying to drive that thing into the ground. And as soon as they put the weight of the pile driver on top of the post, it just sunk 40 feet right into the ground, all the way down through the muck. So they bought a 70 foot pole and I think that was very expensive. And they might've had to even buy a bigger one. They might've had to get like a hundred foot pole or something crazy. Oh, okay. But we got way off track. That's, that's what Marlin Craft will do to you. We have another dapper gentleman. Look at those chops, man. Werner von Siemens. So we can also rep talk about resistance in terms of conductance. So conductance is the inverse of resistance. It's fairly straightforward. It's one over R. And sometimes mathematically, it's better to talk about conductance. So sometimes we'd prefer to, to, to use the inverse of resistance because it sometimes avoids us from having to do a bunch of math with a bunch of inverses. Um, but, you know, and again, this is just not again, because I haven't said it yet, but this is similar to time and frequency. So frequency is the inverse of time. And sometimes we'll use frequency in our, in our equations and analysis, and sometimes we'll use time. And which one we use depends on just which one's most convenient, which one makes the most sense. But in this class, we mostly deal with, with resistance. But I do want to mention conductance. The units of conductance are Siemens, named after Werner, Werner Vaughn over here. You name your kid Werner Vaughn, they're probably going to end up looking like that, I'm guessing. So, um, But he, uh, he's also the, the company, the big you know, you know, international company, uh, Siemens, they're, they're, that's his company. So it, it lives on long after those mutton chops perished there. So... Um, and sometimes the units are also referred to as Mohs. So Mohs just being the word ohm, ohm written backwards, which is very funny. Somebody, we have a lot of clever engineers out there in history. Oh, here's problem B. Here's that orphaned problem over here that I plucked out of the other set. So if we're looking here, we have the conductance shown here. This is labeled as 0.2 Siemens of conductance for this resistor, we can just convert that to resistance. So we can just say R is equal to one over 0.2, which is equal to five ohms. And then we can say this current IB, uh, I didn't leave myself enough space to do it. We can just say IB, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw everything around here. It's 50 divided by 
in there. So I totally didn't do that the right way. So you can go through and actually, you know, do the labeled current type stuff and, and, the, and I flip the equation around automatically, I apologize, but just trying to show you an example that used conductance. I don't, I don't spend much time talking about conductance though. It does become useful a little bit when we talk about combining resistors in parallel, which we'll talk about in chapter three. We don't even usually, we just use one over R plus one over R plus one over R. We just do, we don't even, even then we don't really spend time to convert it and do that. So we just call it one over R. The math is the same either way. Well, let's throw in some more. So we've talked about voltage supplies, current supplies, dependent voltage supplies, dependent current supplies, resistors. Let's toss in a couple more simple two terminal circuit elements. Short circuits, short circuits, also known as a wire. They have no voltage across, across their terminals. These are two terminal devices with no voltage across their terminals and they can take an, have an unlimited amount of current flowing through their terminals with no voltage across it. You can also think of a short circuit as a zero volt voltage supply. Sometimes it's more convenient to think about a short as a zero volt voltage supply, meaning it maintains zero volts across its terminals with regardless of how much current has to flow through it. Then we also have open circuits or sometimes called a break in the circuit. These have no current flow. So they will have zero current flow between their terminals, regardless of the voltage across it. You can also think of these as zero amp current supplies if you want, which sometimes I do. There are times when I like to think about when I'm trying to decide whether to represent something as a short or an open, I think, well, is this, is this a current supply set to zero or a voltage supply set to zero? So, and you'll see that. We'll, we'll talk about that later in this class. And then we have a switch. A switch is fairly intuitive. It's a two terminal circuit element, which we can open and close to convert it from a open circuit to a short circuit. And these are usually used in circuits where we're trying to show a transition. We're trying to show a circuit used in two different states where we have one circuit configuration when the switch is open and a different circuit configuration when the switch is closed. Kirchhoff's laws. Boy, I really threw in the photos here when I was making this. <laughs> Sorry, I made the slideshow days ago and I'm just now presenting it. And so it's, always, it's a lot of facial hair back in the day. All right. So I guess they didn't have, you know, Gillette Mach 3s or whatever, sponsored by Gillette. You got to smash that like button on this video right now. We're going to keep those sponsors happy. So we got Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff was, he, he's mostly known for um, black body radiation for his studies of radiation spectroscopy and, and absorption spectra and emission spectra and things like that. But he's also sort of one of the founders of these underlying principles of circuits and circuit analysis. And so he developed these basic tools that we use that really we use for everything in this class. They sort of set the foundation for, for the analysis that we do. They, they, they're simple equations that allow us to mathematically represent the behavior of complex circuits. Let's start with Kirchhoff's current law. It seems to be the one that's most intuitive for people. So Kirchhoff's current law says basically that whatever current flows into the node of a circuit must also flow out of the node of the circuit. And you can think about that in terms of, I'm gonna switch to, to blue just because it seems more appropriate. So if you think about a river here, let's say you have 200 gallons per minute of water flowing, that's probably a slow flow there, 200 gallons per minute, that seems a little slow. So let's say, whatever, 200 gallons per minute flowing through that river and 800 gallons per minute flowing through that fork of the river. Basically, if you have 200 gallons per minute and 800 gallons per minute flowing into the junction of a river, how much water do you have flowing out of that junction? This is very intuitive. You've probably never been taught anything about rivers or I mean, not, not like river fluid dynamics or anything like that, but you could probably intuit that if you have 200 gallons flowing in from one source and 800 gallons flowing in from another, you've probably got 1000 gallons per minute flowing out of that junction in the river. Makes sense. It's the same thing with current. Kirchhoff's current law says that whatever total current you have flowing into a node of a circuit, flowing into a junction of a circuit, that same total amount of current ultimately has to flow out from somewhere. You, know, you could have seven things flowing in, four things flowing out. 
But the total of those seven things flowing in has to equal the total of those four things flowing out. And that's one way to think about it. We can represent it like that. As the sum of the current, if we know, if we have labeled currents flowing in, labeled currents flowing out, we can say the sum of those labeled flowing in has to equal the sum of those flowing out. The other thing is we can basically just think about all currents as flowing out of a junction or flowing in, I suppose. So if we think about all the currents at a junction flowing into the node or flowing out of the node, we can say the sum of those currents flowing in is equal to zero. We can also say the sum, oof. we can also say the sum of the currents flowing out is equal to zero. Now be careful because a lot of students will see this and see this and they'll see this and they'll think these are the same things. They're not. The top one is for when we're describing currents as when we have labeled currents flowing in and or flowing out. The bottom one is for when we label all of our currents as flowing in or we label all of our currents as flowing out. So if we label all of our currents as flowing in and one of them was actually seven amps flowing out, that would be negative seven amps flowing in to the junction. And it'll make more sense when we do some examples here. But basically, you know, this is fairly intuitive. Students don't seem to struggle with Kirchhoff's current law. So let's do it. Let's do an example here. So we have a, this sort of abstract junction in a circuit shown on the right here. And let's use our two different ways of representing. Let's go back to these equations. Let's do the sum of the currents flowing in equals the sum of the currents flowing out version first. So sum of the currents flowing in. What are my currents flowing into this junction? Labeled, we have this one, this one. So we could say currents flowing in. Five amps plus two amps, and that has to equal the currents flowing out, which are eight amps, I, our unknown I, and three amps. So eight amps plus three amps plus I. So solving this, we have seven amps equals 11 amps plus I minus 11 minus 11. We have I equals negative four amps. So in this case, our current I flowing out of the junction was negative four amps, which means in actuality, I was, or at I here, we had four amps flowing in. It's fine, again, we picked a label. Our solution we found was negative, which means in actuality, the current was flowing the opposite direction of, from what we had it labeled, but that's the way these things go. Now we could have spent a little more time looking at it and realized it, but there, you will quickly get to the point where you can't actually do that. You can't, no matter how much time you spend looking at it, you're not gonna, not gonna get it. I don't know, there's gotta be a shortcut to do this faster. All right, I'm gonna leave that top one. Let's do it the other way. The other way is where we do it, let's just do the sum of the currents flowing out. The other way is if we represent, if we write all of the currents as currents flowing out and we use the appropriate values for that, what's gonna happen? So if we do that as all the currents flowing out, what current do I have flowing out here? I have negative five amps flowing out. And what current do I have flowing out here? Three. And what current do I have flowing out here? I. And what current do I have flowing out here? Negative two. Ugh, this looks bad. Not much better. And my current flowing out here is eight. So in this case, if I write the sum of the currents flowing out, I have negative five plus three plus I plus negative two plus eight equals zero. So the sum of the currents flowing out, if we, if we represent all currents as currents flowing out, some of those currents has to be equal to zero. And again, we could have done this flowing in. How, how would we write this expression for the sum of the currents flowing in is zero? We would take this equation and multiply it by a negative one. And it'd be a positive five, negative three, negative I, positive two, negative eight. So it's, again, it's the same thing, it's same math. And then we'd have a negative zero on this side of the equation, I suppose. So solving this as, so doing the sum of the currents flowing out here, uh, negative five plus a three is negative two, and another negative two, negative four, we got a negative four plus an eight is a four. So we have I plus four equals zero, I equals 
negative four. Boom, same thing. So either way we do it, we're gonna get the same answer as long as we just pick a method and be consistent about it. So this is our law. We call it a law. So I've seen things that label it Kirchhoff's current rule, but KCL is the standard way of describing it. So it's a, it's a, it's a law, I guess. So how do we know it's true? Well, let's go back to our river example. If, if you had 200 gallons per minute and 800 gallons per minute flowing into a river junction and you didn't have 1,000 gallons per minute flowing out, what would that mean? It would mean that you were accumulating water at that junction of the river. And in fact, you kind of can do that, right? The junction of a river can accumulate water. The water level will rise in that case. And very quickly, that junction of the river will flood. But that does happen. So there are times when you might actually have the currents, the sum of the currents flowing into a junction of a river not equaling the current flowing out of the junction. But this would only be true for a brief moment in time. Because allowing that situation to exist for a long time, something would eventually give and you know. Same thing is true with current. Let's say you had current in a junction. The sum of the current flowing into the junction was not the same as the sum of the current flowing out. In that case, you would have, that would mean you have an accumulation of charge. Well, as you probably know from physics and electrostatics, it does not take very much net charge to get very large forces. Forces that will, I mean, they'll eventually physically blow up the charge carrier or you'll have emission of electrons from that carrier because your voltage will become you get this massive voltage you know millions of, of volts potential difference between that node and something else and anyway something will give though but again it's there are on very short time scales times where Kirchhoff's current law is not actually true and there are other laws that you'll learn later on in the curriculum that are more accurate representation of what's happening that take into account you know, flux and things like that rather than just the actual flow of currents. And that, that is all, those laws are more accurate, but, but Kirchhoff's laws are still very useful. So no matter what, they're still useful. They're sort of like the, when you take chemistry in high school, you probably still learn about electrons in these little orbitals orbiting around the nucleus of an atom. And you think of, you think of electrons kind of like planets circling the sun. And that's not true. That's not actually what electrons do. You don't actually have these little particles that are sort of spinning around. But it's useful to think of them that way. It's still very useful to think about them that way. And so Kirchhoff's current law is the same way. So rather than, rather than getting too abstract and too complex, we can keep a simple principle that works for 95% of what we're trying to do. And as long as we know we're operating within that 95% of the time, we're good to go. And in this class, you're operating in that 95% of the time. So Kirchhoff's current law is a law as far as we're concerned. Kirchhoff's voltage law. This one is definitely the one that causes more issues with students. It's a little bit less intuitive. So like always, whenever something's not intuitive to me, I switch to a domain where it is intuitive for me. And gravity is fairly intuitive. I've had to deal with gravity my whole life, <laughs> probably maybe more than some other people. So, um, so, let, so let's think about it in terms of gravity. So Kirchhoff's voltage law says that the total voltage change around any closed path in a circuit is zero. And you can say that, and it doesn't make, mean much the first time you hear it. So let's go to a roller coaster example. Let's go to gravitational potential energy. So let's say you're talking gravitational potential energy and you have a roller coaster and you start here on this roller coaster. And as you move along this roller coaster path, you're basically increasing your gravitational potential energy and decreasing your gravitational potential energy. And you'll do that by when you go up to the top of this hill, right? You might go up 50 feet. And then going down here, you might go down 40 feet. And then going up here, I don't know, you might go up 60 feet. Right? But you're, as you go along this roller coaster, you're going to be going up and down. You're gonna be gaining and losing gravitational potential energy. But the idea is if you start here on this roller coaster and you work your way around and you get back to where you started, what was your net change in gravitational potential energy? Zero. As long as you get back to where you started, the total, the sum of your ups and the sum of your downs, it's gotta equal zero. So 
you've got to you got to go up as much as you go down to get back to where you started. It's the same thing with Kirchhoff's voltage law. Kirchhoff's voltage law says you're at some electrical potential at some point where you start in a circuit, and you wander through that circuit. And as you wander through the circuit, you're increasing your electrical potential. You're going up. You go through a voltage increase and the voltage decrease and another voltage increase and another voltage increase and maybe a big decrease, something like that. But the idea is once you get back to where you started, the total electrical potential change has to be zero. The total voltage change has to be zero. So you can think about that and that's for any path through the circuit. You know, if this roller coaster had multiple pathways, it doesn't matter, right? As long as you get back to where you started, the total change is gonna be zero. Let's, let's use this, let's do some examples of this. So let's look at this circuit and let's say, what's these, what are these unknown voltage values here? Let's see, what's that V1 there? Let's use Kirchhoff's voltage law. And we're gonna start by using Kirchhoff's voltage law in kind of an abstract way. We're just gonna think about it intuitively. So let's start here in our circuit. And as we go from here to here, what happened? We went up 10 volts in electrical potential. So we went up 10 volts, we, we, came in the, we came in the low side, we came out the high side, we increased, uh, and we had an increase of 10 volts moving from the bottom to the top. And then what happened as we came down here? We had a decrease of four volts. So then if we go from here and get back to where we started, we went up 10, we went down four, to get back to where we started, we have to go down what? Yeah, we have to go down another six volts. So we know this has to be, we know it has to be six volts just thinking about it. And then if we know the V1 is six volts, let's do, let's do it again for this loop over here. Let's start here, change my color here. We'll start here. Whoa. Start here. And we're going to go up six volts, then down three volts. So then how much, how much potential do we have to drop? How much voltage do we have to drop going from here to here? If we went up six and down three, we have to go down another three. So we had to have a three volt drop here. Now this might be a little bit weird because we're kind of saying, oh, well, we're just sort of thinking about this. Well, we went up 10 and then we went down four. What if this is a really complex circuit? What if we went up six and then down 14 and then, and then up X and then down, you know, Y times four, you know, we have to have a more, we can't just sort of think about this as, okay, we've gone up this amount, we've gone down this amount. So we have to have a method to this. And the method that we go over in the book, the method the book uses is, we always, as we go around the loop, we add up the sum of the voltage drops. So we're adding up the sum of the voltage drops. And we're saying, just like in, in, uh, in uh, Kirchhoff's current law, where we said the sum of the currents flowing in equals the sum of the currents flowing out can also be thought of as the total current flowing out is zero or the total current flowing in is zero. We can do the same thing with Kirchhoff's voltage law, where we can say, the sum total of the voltage drop around any path is going to be zero. And as long as we're adding up, as long as we're every, we're treating every circuit element by writing down the quantity of voltage dropped, it's gonna work out just fine for us. We can say the sum total of voltage drops around a loop is zero. Why voltage drops and not voltage increase or not increase and decrease all lumped together? Because we're trying to be consistent here. If we pick one method and be consistent with it for any circuit combination, Using, maintaining that consistency is gonna help prevent us from making mistakes. So let's go through and use our consistent approach to doing this same analysis here. Somebody's trying to call me here, sorry about that. So in this case, we go, let's start here and let's add up our voltage drops. Okay, so starting here, we're gonna go around this, we're gonna do a Kirchhoff voltage law analysis here. Starting here, going across this voltage supply, what's happening? We are going up 10 volts. But I told you just now, we are gonna do the sum of the voltage drops. So going up 10 volts is the same as a voltage drop of negative 10 volts. Now, going from here to here, what's my voltage drop? 
fairly easy. In this case, we're going into the labeled positive terminal and out the labeled negative terminal. So that is a voltage drop. So it's just going to be four. And then my unknown here, V1, is I just, I just wrote it and labeled it that way. So it is also labeled right now as a voltage drop. So we are going to, going from here to here, our voltage drop could just be represented as V1. Why is that a drop? So we're entering the labeled positive and coming out the labeled negative. That is, we are dropping whatever that voltage is. That's the uh, electrical potential per unit charge that we're dropping going from one side to the other. So, and we can say that equals zero. And we can solve this equation where we can say negative six plus V1 equals zero, V1 equals six volts. And that's as labeled here. Okay, now let's do this other side. So I'm going to do another loop here. I might as well change color here. So now we're going to do this loop. We're going to start here. Why did I start there? I don't know. I could have started anywhere. Could have gone in any loop. I like clockwise loops. That's my thing. Later on in chapter four, I'm going to kind of strongly encourage you to do clockwise loops, but just be consistent. Be consistent with these things is, is the main thing to keep prevent from making mistakes. So starting here, what is my voltage drop going from here to here? And it's, it's getting, becoming a mess here. There's not enough color here. Well, V1 is labeled, we are entering the negative terminal of V1 and coming out the labeled positive terminal of V1. So V1 is actually our voltage increase. So our voltage drop going from here to here is gonna be negative V1. So we are, we're going up V1 volts, which another way to put that is we're going, we're dropping negative V1 volts. Okay, so negative V1 and then what's my voltage drop going from here to here. Well, we're going into the positive terminal of a three volts and out the negative. So that's gonna be a drop of three volts. And then here to here, we are dropping V2 volts. So in this case, we already knew that V1 was six. So we have negative six plus three plus V2 equals zero. V2 equals three. So using a technique, following this process of writing the sum of the voltage drops around any closed loop in our circuit equals zeros, this is a great way for us to build equation, to build a, a, um, an equation around a loop. And you know it doesn't make much sense now because our equation was just V. But if you think about it, if we're writing equations, we can use Kirchhoff's current law to write equations in terms of current, and we can use Kirchhoff's voltage law to use, write equations in terms of voltage. And we have Ohm's law, which for a resistor gives us a relationship between voltage and current. These three things give us a very powerful tool to solve for all the unknown voltages and all the unknown currents in our circuits. Let's do it. Let's put the pieces together. So we have a more complicated circuit here. And what we're gonna do is we are gonna use Kirchhoff's voltage, Kirchhoff's current Ohm's law to solve for these unknowns here, solve for this unknown I is zero. And just to give you a taste of the future, this is what we do all of chapter three and four on. And I already told you this a little bit and because I always tend to you know, not review my notes before I go over them. So you know, I, 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 bury the, I don't bury the lead, I guess. I, I, I uncover these exciting little nuggets of wisdom that I meant to drop later on, but it's okay to hear it multiple times. Everything you need to do for the next month or two in this class, you know right now. Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law. The remainder of this next month or so of work in the class is going to be, how do we make sure we are finding an optimal, how do we make sure we are finding a set of equations to solve for unknowns where there's not too many equations, where there's not too many unknowns? How do we minimize the work we have to do and make sure we don't have errors and make sure that we, without much struggle, without much trial and error, are getting the sets of equations that are gonna be useful for us to find our solutions. But for right now, you've got everything you need. And you might not believe me because we've only done simple examples, but we'll start to do slightly more complex examples. So let's look at the circuit over here on the right. Well, let's look at it for a while and then I flip to the next slide where we actually label a little bit more. So when we're analyzing this circuit, we have to consider the unknowns. You know, we, we, there's some things we know about this circuit. We know 
the resistances of all the resistors. If you know the voltage of the voltage supply, we know the current and the current supply. But there's a few things about the circuit we don't know. We don't know, for instance, VO, this unknown that we're trying to solve. We don't know the current flowing through this branch, so flowing through this wire here. So we don't know. So that's what we now labeled IO. Let me just double check that. No, no, IO is what we we're trying to find. I take it all back. So we don't know this current. We don't know this voltage. We don't know this current. So what are we gonna do? We're just gonna create variables. Right? Anytime you don't know the answer to something, you don't know this detail of your circuit, create a variable, give it a name. So we have this unknown IO and this unknown I1. Oh, we also have this unknown voltage. We don't know the voltage across the 50 ohm resistor. But also notice the voltage across the 50 ohm resistor is also the voltage across the six amp current supply. Why? Because they share two terminals. So whatever potentials across one, whatever uh, voltage is across one is gonna be the same as the voltage across the other. So it's, it's kind of the same unknown. So two unknown currents, two unknown voltages in this circuit. Let's find what we need to find. How are we gonna solve for these unknowns? Well, if you were in a math class and you had four unknowns, what would you do? You would probably try to find four linearly independent equations that use those unknown variables. And that's basically the same thing we're gonna do now. Although we might not necessarily have to solve them all at once. We might be able to get to figure out one and then sort of add in a little more detail and get some others later. So, but right now we are gonna basically stumble our way through these equations trying to find these unknowns. And when you do the homework for this chapter and even parts of chapter three, you're gonna feel a lot of times like you're just stumbling your way through where what technique do you use? Do you just keep throwing equations at it until you have enough equations to solve for your unknowns? And if that feels weird, there's kind of, it's partially deliberate on the part of the book and the part on me and assigning you the problems because that kind of uneasiness about, I'm not quite sure why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm just kind of throwing equations at it and I'm not sure they're useful. That's kind of the, the struggle that we alleviate in chapter four with the techniques that we learn there. So, so let's write some equations. Let's do a, uh, let's do a Kirchhoff's, well, first of all, what are we trying to find? We're trying to find IO. That's gonna be our main thing we're trying to solve for. So let me readjust. If my butt's hurting from teaching you this and you might, might wanna take a break. I mean, hopefully you've already taken a break, but I'm getting sore just from talking to you and I'm sitting down. So, so we're trying to find IO. So let's try to keep things represented as IO if we can. How about that? We'll try to keep things represented as IO. So if we're trying to find equations relating to IO, I'd personally like to write a Kirchhoff's current law equation right at this node B. So if we write a Kirchhoff's current law equation in node B, we could say some of the currents in equals some of the currents out. We could say some of the currents out equals zero. We could say some of the currents in equals zero. Later on, we're gonna always just write the sum of the currents flowing out equals zero. But for now, Let's just do some of the currents flowing in equals some of the currents flowing out. So at node B, what are, what's our current flowing in? We have six amps flowing in from this supply here. Right, we know we have six amps flowing that way. So our currents flowing in are gonna be six amps. What other current do we have flowing in? Well, we have IO. IO is the direction labeled for IO is flowing in. And then what current do we have flowing out? I1, the current labeled I1 is our current flowing out. So the currents flowing in has to equal current flowing out. Great, we've almost got, we have an equation for IO that only has one other unknown variable. So we, let's, we gotta try to find out this, uh, this I1. If we wanna solve for IO, we have to get another equation that at least uses I1. Well, um, how can we get that other equation? Let's first of all, clean this up a little bit. Well, we use Kirchhoff's current law. Let's throw a Kirchhoff's voltage law at this thing. Let's write a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around this loop of our circuit. And this time I am gonna be deliberate with, let's add the voltage drops here. How about that? So some, some of the voltage drops equals zero. Starting here, what's my voltage drop going across this voltage supply? Well, I'm going up 120 volts, which is the same as dropping negative 120 volts. I know this is weird. I know you hate that. I know that feels weird to write, to see something easy. Like we went up 120 volts and write it as dropping negative 120 volts. I know you hate that. 
and you probably hate me and that's fine. I can, I can deal with that, but it's definitely going to be better later on when we're consistent with this because when we're not consistent with this all the time, students get signs mixed up. So for now, we're just always writing voltage drops from here on out. So going in, continuing on our trek around this loop in our circuit, going in this direction, what's my voltage drop across that 10 ohm resistor? Well, we already actually have that labeled and lucky for us, that's already labeled as a drop. So our drop, we're going in the positive labeled side of VO, out the negative labeled side. So that drop is VO. And then lastly, to get back to where we started, we're doing this drop across the 50 ohm resistor. Luckily, that's also labeled as V1. So we are going, entering the positive label, exiting the negative label. That is a drop direction. So we have plus V1 equals zero. Well, unfortunately, this didn't really help us that much because this was an equation of I1 and I0, and this is an equation of V1 and V0. So we, we didn't help ourselves out at all, except for what's our equation we know that relates current and voltage? Ohm's law. So Ohm's law. So we have these voltages V0 and V1, and we want them represented as currents, I0 and I1. It's a great time to use Ohm's law here. So as labeled, I'll clean this up once again. As labeled, we have VO, we have IO labeled flowing into the positive terminal of VO. So by passive sign convention, we're gonna use the equation V equals IR. We can say VO equals IO times 10. And also we can do the same thing for I1 and V1. I1 is labeled flowing into the positive to label terminal of V1. So once again, we're gonna use V is equal to IR. So we could say, V1 equals I1 oh. times 50. Okay. So now um, we just got to plug these in. So let's just take, we're trying to solve for IO. So let's get these expressed as IO. So we're going to substitute in for V0 of that. And for V1 that. So we're going to say negative 120 plus IO times 10 plus I1 times 50 equals zero. Okay. And now we got to get rid of this I1, which the good thing is we can substitute in this expression here. So plugging that in, we have negative 120 plus IO times 10 plus six plus IO times 50 equals zero. And that's going to be, so we have 50 IO here, 10 IO, so we negative 120 plus we got 50 IO and 10 IO, so that's 60 IO. And again, this is just math at this point, which is actually not my job to make sure you know this, it's your math teacher's job. So uh, really I care mostly about getting the equation, right? You should be able to do the math. I mean, that's why we have a prerequisite of the math stuff, but you know, it's not, this is not, this is not the teaching part. This is just the me trying not to make a mistake on the internet, so it's there forever. I look stupid. And then we got, uh, so then we also had that six and that 50, that should be 300 if memory serves correct. And that should equal zero. So running out of space here, we have 60 IO equals 300 negative 120. Um, so 300 negative 120 is uh, 180. We flop it to the other side of the equation is negative 180. So we get, so divide by 60. All right, and we got IO equals negative three. 
So solving this, we found out IO is negative three and that's fine. So in reality, IO, this unknown current IO was the current was actually flowing the opposite direction from how it was labeled, but again, doesn't really matter. So that's it. How did I get this? How did I choose to do a mesh current at node B and and a node voltage, sorry, not mesh current, yes. Kirchhoff, how did I choose to do a Kirchhoff's current law at node B and Kirchhoff's voltage law around the 120 volt, 10 ohm, 50 ohm loop? How did I know that was gonna give you my answers? I didn't, I kind of just sort of guessed. I picked equations. I knew I was solving for IO, so I wanted to generate equations that had IOs and I just kind of kept doing this until I had enough equations that I could solve them and find my unknown IO. And again, this uncertainty as to the process we follow is the reason for chapters three and four, which are the process where we build, we build the process there. Let's do one more example and then let's call it good because I am ready for dinner. You don't know, you don't know where or when I'm recording this video, but I could go for dinner right now. Okay, so let's do a dependent supply. We're just gonna just crank it to 11 here. We already had made it, we already jumped and made a difficult a circuit analysis example and now let's make it even more difficult with a dependent supply. Same thing, we're just gonna stumble our way through the circuit. We got tools at our disposal. We got Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and Ohm's law. Let's stumble our way through the math and try to solve for these unknowns here. So we have a dependent supply, which is three IS. So immediately I focus on me, what is the IS? So IS as labeled is here. Let's find this, this unknown current IS. We can do this pretty much right now. So we know that we have 10 volts across here. Again, that's the 10 volt supply in this case shares two terminals with a six ohm resistor. So we know there's 10 volts across this six ohm resistor. And our labeled current IS is flowing into the labeled, that labeled positive of the resistor. Now I know this is weird because it's IS is flowing out of the positive terminal, the 10 volt supply but it's flowing into the same positive of the six ohm resistor. I know that feels weird, but we're writing the equation. We're gonna write a, a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation, or sorry, we're gonna write an Ohm's law equation for the resistor. So we care about from the perspective of the resistor. From the perspective of the resistor, the current is flowing into the positive 10, the, the positive polarity labeling of that 10 volt potential across it. So, so we can say, V equals IR in this case, where we have 10 volts equals IS times six ohms. So we say IS equals 10 divided by six amps. Okay. And I don't feel the need to, to simplify it any more than that. We'll just call it 10 divided by six amps. So that's cool, we have IS. We found IS immediately, it was fairly easy. All we had to do was apply Ohm's law there. And that means that we can deal with this a little bit better. So if we know that the voltage of the supply is three IS, three IS equals three times 10 over six, that's gonna equal five volts. So we know that's five volts there. We, we already solved for that little piece. We know it's five volts. Now let's try to find these unknowns IO and VO here. So I'm going to focus on one at a time. I am going to first try to find IO. And there's something interesting I want to talk about too with this circuit. Look at this little connection here. Is there any current flowing there? Think for a sec. Think, this is a good positive, I haven't done a positive video. Pause the video. Is there current flowing through this wire? Pause it, think to yourself, come back. Okay, what did you come up with? So let's say, let's say you, you thought there was current flowing through this or potentially current flowing through this wire. Think, if current is flowing from this side of the circuit over to this side, there has to be some way for that current to flow back. We can't, we can't just have a net, a net flow of current from one side of a circuit to another without the current coming back. 
Because what would that mean, right? I mean, another way to think about it is if there if the current here was not zero, then the problem is whatever this current is, that's the same current that oops that flows back around here and comes back this way. So this current and this current have to have the same magnitude in opposite directions which means if there was any non-zero current here, it would have to come back like somewhere up here. Have, there have to be some other place for it to come back. Anytime you have two sides of a circuit that are connected by only one wire, the current through that wire has got to be zero. There's no way for current to flow back. And so you're in that same position where you're either gonna have this accumulation of charge which is gonna make it blow up, um, or there's gonna be no current flow and there's gonna be no current flow. So kind of a quick little aside. So now that we, you know, thoroughly uglied up our diagram here, let's go back to writing these equations. How am I going to solve for these? I don't know. Let's 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 do a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation. Let's do a Kirchhoff's voltage law around this loop here. And before we do that, we don't have there's there's a label of voltage that's missing, and that's this voltage here. I call it V1 because that's not taken yet. Why did I choose that labeled direction? Uh, it was arbitrary. I could have written it the other way. Um, you know what? Let's write it the other way. Just to really put myself on the spot. What if we labeled it like that? Okay, let's go through the analysis like that just for fun. So let's do a... Hopefully you can remember this was the math for the finding the five volts, but we know that now. So Kirchhoff's voltage law, starting here, I always like to start at that bottom left corner, don't know why, working our way around, what's the voltage drop across this supply? Well, we're going up five volts, which means the voltage drop is negative five volts. Now what's the, what's the voltage drop across this two ohm resistor? Well, because, because I just decided to make my life difficult, the labeled voltage V1 is actually a voltage increase. We're going into the negative terminal and coming out the positive terminal. So that is we're going up V1 volts as labeled, which means my voltage drop is negative V1. And then as labeled VO, VO, we're entering the positive terminal of VO coming out. The negative, that is dropping across VO. So we are, our voltage drop is gonna be VO and all that has to equal zero. Okay, and now we're in a situation where what is V1 and V0 don't really help us right now. But we can, I'm trying to find IO. I said I was gonna solve for IO first. But how can we take these voltages and convert them into currents? That's right, Ohm's law. So we can use Ohm's law. So for V1, V1 as labeled, we have this current IO as labeled entering the negative terminal of the label V1. So what version of Ohm's law do we have to use? Or, sorry, yeah, what version of Ohm's law do we have to use? The negative version, we have to say V1, so the negative version, when our, when our labeled current is entering our labeled terminal, we have to use V equals negative IR. So in this case, that's, uh, V1 equals negative IO times two. Cool. So we can plug that in to here. And then what about for VO? Well, for V, the same, IO, IO is still flowing through here. So, we, so I, we still have IO current flowing into the positive terminal of labeled VO. So our version of that is gonna be V equals IR. So we can say VO equals IO times three. And that we can substitute in here. And so what do we get? We get negative five volts plus uh, negative V1, 
so it's going to be negative negative IO times two. So it's going to be IO times two plus IO times three equals zero. So negative five volts plus five IO equals zero. So IO equals five volts divided by five, which is equal to one amp. So IO is one amp, just by just doing the math after plugging that in. What if we still wanted to find VO? So luckily we, we already wrote the expression for VO as a function of IO. So VO equals one amp times three ohms. Sometimes I don't write my units and that's okay for me. You might want to, but it, it becomes the biggest, bigger issue when we're dealing with millivolts and, and volts and milli ohms and ohms and different units like that. That's when units really become critical. Uh, I'm kind of playing fast and loose with them mostly just for space and because I hate writing on the tablet, but so VO is equal to three. So even in this, this is a more complex example. What was our technique? We had no technique. We just tossed an equation down. We used Kirchhoff's voltage law to make an equation. We could use Kirchhoff's current law too. It's really about finding our unknowns, using Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law to write equations that involve our unknowns and then trying to combine them as best we can to find our answer. And that's, that's the best tool we've got now. And those tools you're gonna use in this homework to do a couple of examples. And they're gonna be a bit of a struggle and know it will get better once we switch to the techniques in chapter three and four. But for now, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it. Have a great week and enjoy that homework number two.